after the applicants have introduced themselves, we will give any member of the audience who is here who desires to speak in opposition to any of the applicants an opportunity to voice his or her objections uh, uh, following that. And, and it, it, it is rare, but, but not, in, it is infrequent, but not impossible that there may be someone who wishes to speak in opposition to an applicant. Uh, we have not had any contacts from anyone asking for time on our agenda to do that. So for applicants, if you're looking around the room trying to figure out if, <laughs> if the storm is brewing, we're not aware of one. Uh, uh, after that process, uh, we will begin our interviews of uh, each applicant. And we are going to be doing that today in reverse alphabetical order. We switch depending on uh, from one meeting to another. So in, we're uh, in reverse alphabetical order today, and so when I call your name, please come up and uh, we'll begin the discussions. Now, as, as the applicants know, you've had a lengthy conversation either in telephone or by person uh, with one of the members of the commission, and I, uh, we randomly assign one member of the commission to have a a discussion with each applicant, uh, primarily to find out a little bit more about the applicant that may not be on the application, uh, to answer any questions the applicant has. Uh, the person that's assigned is not the applicant's advocate. Uh, it is simply, he or she is simply a representative of the commission to do that additional deep dive before we start. Uh, that person will begin the questioning uh, when we get into that process. Uh, you'll also uh, may find today, as, as we do in most of the hearings, that, that members of the commission will not have questions for one or more of the applicants. Uh, that's not uncommon. It does not mean that that person has made up his or her mind. It does not mean that they're disinterested. It just means they have no questions. Uh, the questions that they would have asked have already been asked. Uh, and so please do not think that if any one or more of us say I have no questions for any particular applicant, that that's some sort of sign about where that commissioner's leaving, uh, uh, where, where uh, that would be incorrect. Uh, I know a lot of folks wonder how, what kind of tenor are these proceedings going to be? And uh, we are, this is not a court of law. Uh, so we don't worry about your honor. We're not wearing black robes. Uh, we, we view this as a professional conversation between members of a learned profession. And uh, we appreciate brevity. We appreciate candor. Uh, we appreciate humor when it's appropriate. Uh, 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 we want this to really be as informal as you're comfortable being. Uh, uh, after the interviews are completed, we will then immediately take our initial vote. Uh, there are eight of us uh, today, so it will take five members to vote affirmatively to send a name to the governor. Uh, it is not, infre not infrequent that we will select those names on the first ballot but it is also not unheard of that we may have a second or even a third ballot. Uh, and I'll explain, explain that process more as, uh, uh, as we go on. Uh, does the commission have anything it wants to add before we, before we begin? All right, if not, I believe that we're going to begin with uh, Mr. Spitzer. Welcome and good morning. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. Before I start with my remarks, the Honorable Sandra Donaghy is here from the 10th District to say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. Your Honor. I am the criminal court judge in the 10th Judicial District, but before I took the bench, I was an assistant district attorney here in the 7th Judicial District. I was Ryan Spitzer's direct supervisor, for, so for seven years I was able to watch his practice of law. Based on my experience and my observations, I've come to the conclusion that he is a critical thinker, able to synthesize very complex issues in, and hone in on that which is important. 
He is a hard worker, diligent in everything that he does. He is a man of ethics. I looked at the statistics from the Administrative Office of the Court's website, and for fiscal year 2019-2020, 90% of the new case filings are criminal cases. So the person who will take the, the bench next in this district has got to have a strong criminal background so that they can hit the ground running. Mr. Spitzer possesses both the breadth and the depth of experience to fill that position. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor, for those kind remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined here today with, by my lovely wife, Tracy, and her parents. And uh, when this whole process, appointments process started for, for um, my wife said to me, she said, you know, you argue cases in criminal court all the time, but you're gonna have to learn to talk about yourself. You're gonna have to step outside your comfort zone a little bit, and that can be a little awkward. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about this position. As Judge Donaghy mentioned, the vast majority of cases here in Anderson County in this court are criminal. We're not like a lot of other districts where we have a circuit court that does civil matters and then a separate criminal court judge to do criminal matters. Here, those offices are combined into one judge who carries both responsibilities. And that's not just me saying it. As General Donaghy, or Judge Donaghy pointed out, those stats are available on the AOC website. Now, when you look at my application, you see started out at a junior college, worked nights in a factory to put myself through undergrad, served six years as a medic in the National Guard, graduated from a top 20 law school, went back to my little hometown of Humboldt and had a general civil practice for four years before I applied statewide and moved across the state for an opportunity to be a prosecutor. Here's where I met my lovely wife, Tracy. We now have two boys. She grew up here, graduated from Oak Ridge High School, and this is home now and forever. It's been an honor to serve the people of Anderson County as a prosecutor, and I've been right here in this court for the last nearly 14 years, serving in front of Judge Elledge, who just retired. I'm familiar with this court system. I'm familiar with the defense bar, with the public defender, with the clerks, with the grand jury. I'm prepared to address the grand jury backlog that's accumulated while we've been delayed and hindered by the COVID epidemic. I'm ready to step on and take step, step up and take, take this challenge on. Um, Judge Elledge would always say about drug court in particular, when he would talk about the resources that went into that, he would always say, you know, if we could save just one life, it's worth it. The, judge, the drug court here in Anderson County is something I'm familiar with. I'm familiar with all the other programs like community corrections and, and state probation and misdemeanor probation. But drug court is something I am passionate about, something I am committed to continuing here in Anderson County. I was there when Judge Elledge held his last day of drug court. And you could see all of the tearful appreciation from the people who were in that program, people who were on felony probation, and how much they appreciated all that he had done. And as Judge Elledge was getting his awards and taking photographs with everybody and, and trying not to tear up himself, he leaned over to me and he said, you see what matters. Because for him, being able to help people, not just put people in prison, not just go through the numbers and put folks on probation, but to genuinely help people turn their lives around was something he was passionate about. And it's something I'm committed to myself. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Crutchfield. <laughs> good morning. I'm Karen Crutchfield, and I have asked my good friends, Heather Anderson and John Willis, to speak on my behalf. Thank you. Ms. Anderson. Good morning. Thank you. Um, thank you, Karen, for this honor. I know I have written to many of you over many years. Um, appreciate your service. I really don't know how y'all do this trekking across the state. There's so much information, plus you all have busy jobs and lives, too. Um, I'm Heather Anderson. I'm a lawyer here in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I've been for almost 18 years. Um, I'm a partner at Bernstein, Stair, and McAdams, where Karen practices. And I want you all to know that she has the full support of the firm, even though we would be very sad 
uh, for her to leave. She's a hard worker. She jumps into any any case. I pulled her into one at 11 o'clock at night when we were both at the office, and she jumped right in feet first. She has energy that's boundless. I do not, so I admire her for that. Um, We've known each other for more than 15 years through a community organization that's law related. She's also put uh, so much energy and effort into that that I, I truly admire her and feel like when I reflect on the qualities that I would like to see in a judge, she has the judicial temperament of a judge. She has a calm manner and she considers all perspectives. I have uh, no hesitation with regarding the criminal aspect of this position. Um, as I told um, friends and others when I, when Pamela Reeves was going through the process to become a federal judge, she had very little criminal experience, yet she's also, she was also the same demeanor and approach as Karen. She dove right into it and didn't miss a beat. And I've talked to several attorneys who practiced in front of Judge Reeves and said she, she did a wonderful job. So I have no doubts about that. Um, I am also from a tiny town called Humboldt, Tennessee. <laughs> Hi. I've never known two people to be in the same room <laughs> at the same time. But um, my father practiced law there and was a, a city judge for many years. So it is, um, it's a great place. Um, anyway, Karen has high ethical standards. I have uh, highly recommend her. She's highly regarded in the legal community here and all across East Tennessee. And my uh, successor is John Willis, and he's a talker, so I'm going to give him the rest of my time. Thank you so much. Members of the commission, thank you for allowing me to have just a couple of minutes to talk about my good friend, uh, Karen Crutchfield. I, like all of you do, I have a firm belief that in addition to having the intellect, the sense of, of ethics, the knowledge, the base of legal knowledge, and the temperament to be a judge, to be a good judge, to be a successful judge, you have to have a heart to serve your community. And what I want to do today is to assure every member of this, com this commission that Karen Crutchfield has that heart. She has a gigantic heart uh, to serve her community, and that community being Anderson County. She has lived in Anderson County for more than two decades, even though she is from our neighbor to the south. Uh, I have known Karen for better than two decades. Once you reach a certain age, I've decided I'm just going to say I've done everything for 20 plus years, you know. <laughs> so I've practiced law for 20 plus years. I've known Karen for 20 plus years. Um, and I just wanted to have the opportunity to tell you all that she is as involved in her community in Anderson County as anyone I know. She has gone through leadership Oak Ridge. She has, anytime someone asks her to pull into an organization, uh, the pro bono hours she has provided to all kinds of different efforts in this community are uh, untold. How I have seen her and worked shoulder to shoulder with her is through the local Anderson County CASA organization, which I know some of you are intimately familiar with and most of you I'm sure know, shameless plug, support your local CASA. That is an organization that truly uh, supports the most uh, endangered, the most vulnerable children in our society. Karen got me involved in that organization. I didn't know anything about it. She pulled me in. She let me know what they did, spoon fed me. I saw her take a leadership role with the board there and she served again, not because she wanted a pelt on her wall about the good she was doing, but because of the heart that she had uh, for what that organization was doing, and she's done it many, many times over. And so, for that reason, I highly recommend Karen Crutchfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Capps. Good morning, members. I'm Elizabeth Capps, and I'm joined today by my husband, David, and my good friends, uh, several of my good friends, 
My speaker today is Vanessa Johnson. She's currently the staff attorney for the Court of Criminal Appeals. She's also been a capital case attorney. I do, in the interest of full disclosure, I'd like to say that my office was next to Judge Cox for quite some time. Um, and also, I did interview as your law, for your law clerk position. If you, hopefully this job interview goes a little better than that one did. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in the interest of full disclosure, I thought I'd let you guys know that. Uh, and I'm gonna cede the floor to Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as Beth mentioned, I am the staff attorney for the Court of Criminal Appeals right now. I have been since 2012, and prior to that, I spent 10 years in the trial courts as a capital case attorney assisting trial judges in Upper East Tennessee. And I've also served um, in three different appellate court chambers for the Court of Criminal Appeals judges. Um, so that being said, I'm unaccustomed to being in this position right now, so forgive me if I sound nervous. And also, I think for full disclosure, because we've all been mingling, Karen Crutchfield was a friend of mine during law school and in my first wedding, but that was <laughs> more than 20 years ago. <laughs> a new husband and another child since. So, um, members of the Trial Court Vacancy Commission and interested citizens, um, I'm here on behalf of Beth Mitchell Capps. Um, through my service in the judicial department, I met Beth 10 years ago when she had moved to East Tennessee to work as a senior judicial clerk for Judge Kelly Thomas. She already had ample experience, of course, with um, the work we do, but she quickly became a valuable part of our close-knit Eastern Division family where not only do we work diligently to serve the citizens of Tennessee, but we share in each other's burdens and joys. Over the course of our friendship, I've seen Beth's strength and tenacity as she, as when barely a, a past a young newlywed, cared for her husband Derek, who was stricken with ALS. Not only did she continue unfettered in her dedication to her professional responsibilities, but she also became a fierce advocate for his care. We all shared the sorrow of his loss, but were impressed with her determination throughout that tragic experience. During a time when many might withdraw, Beth extended her kindness to others and her resiliency shone through, and we celebrated when she later met and married her husband, David. As an attorney assisting judges within the judicial department, Beth is a lifelong student of the law, with vast research, analytical, and writing experience. I tried to run some numbers in my head based on my experience and kind of who she's worked for, and last night I came up with, she has probably assisted over, assisted judges in reaching over a thousand judicial determinations related to criminal cases. Um, as Justice Koch would know, you, you know the background and the backstory of how we all work in the department. Um, Although any advocate should possess these skills, judicial decision making requires a heightened level of understanding of statutory law, legal precedent, policy, and the Constitution, as well as the ability to research and analyze the proper application of these guideposts to a particular case. Through her experience as a member of the support staff, Beth brings that heightened ability to the bench. Professionally, I've counted Beth as a trusted peer for both her legal analysis and perspective. Um, because we're often collaborators in our judicial work, um, Beth has been a vital part of the analysis and development of judicial decisions and policy, not only within each chamber she's worked, but also in discussions with other law clerks, staff attorneys, and judges. Her demeanor and in her interactions with others, court staff, judges, peers, is humble, confident, encouraging, and never combative. I feel like she will bring these same character traits in her interactions with litigants, attorneys, and court staff as a circuit judge. Um, most significantly, though, for 20 years, Beth has been in the unique position that many attorneys do not have, as she has enjoyed a first-hand view of judicial decision-making. This experience points to her success on the trial bench simply because she is keenly knowledgeable about what makes a good judge. Apart from an understanding of the law, Beth has also witnessed the demeanor and attitude of the most effective judges across the state and will carry that knowledge to her own service on the bench. She understands the competing interest presented in, a, in the circuit court because she studied legal issues from the impartial position of a judge rather than as a litigator and advocate. In closing, I would encourage you to um, select Beth as a candidate for consideration by Governor Bill Lee for the seventh judicial district circuit court vacancy. Her learned understanding of the law, work ethic, and humble demeanor make her an outstanding choice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Cantrell, I want to make sure I have that right. In East it's Tennessee, it's Cantrell. Cantrell. West Tennessee, it's Cantrell. So. It's who my nephew, that's who my son's named after. Gotcha. Um, I'm Dale Cantrell, and 
as I get ready to say my introduction, the first thing that jumped out at me is I'm 10 to 15 years older than the other candidates here, and I have been to Humboldt to try cases, although I am not <laughs> from there. Um, and I could speak very highly on both Karen and Ryan in that I've had cases with Karen over the years. You won't find a better lawyer. And I got to know Ryan when he was on the trail running for the General Sessions job last time. So I've never met some caps before, but they're good people. Um, I was born and raised here. I have practiced law in the state of Tennessee for a little over 30 years, right at 30 years. And our practice goes from Mountain City to Memphis. And this court is important. Ryan said something about we're a little different in this judicial district and that we don't have a separate criminal judge and a circuit judge. They made a change back in the late 50s, early 60s, in order for us to get a chancellor, we had to give up one of the circuit positions so they combined our two courts. So the deal that they worked out was one week would be civil week, one week would be criminal week. One thing that concerns me is to say, oh, we're just going to make this a criminal court because I believe that it needs to be a circuit court and a criminal court. From an experience standpoint, I have tried easily over 300 jury trials as lead counsel and close to, if not more than 1,000 bench trials throughout the state of Tennessee and in other jurisdictions. Um, I'm also the only candidate, I believe, that has judicial experience. I was appointed by the governor to be an administrative law judge for several years. Um, I was the referee for Anderson County before we had our second general sessions judge hearing criminal and civil cases and stepped away from those positions when our first son was born who had cerebral palsy. So it became a little time consuming to, to do both or I would have probably stayed on a judicial track. Uh, like Dean Koch, I also come from an academic track. I was a professor at the University of Tennessee College of Law for 10 years. And I think that this position is extremely important at this moment in that we have an opportunity to make this court system better, to particularly make our court system here in the 7th Judicial District better. There is a backlog of cases, but that's true in every jurisdiction at this stage. Um, I have a definite plan going forward, and I think it's important that people understand how things work in a courtroom. If you've never tried a case, if you have never been before a jury, if you don't even know how the rules work, I think it's very difficult to be a judge. Um, the final thing I would say is I never meant to be a lawyer. I went to school to become a basketball coach. That's all I ever wanted to be. Um, and I just, as I kept going from basketball job to basketball job, ultimately I went to law school to try to get a better basketball job and the pay in law was a lot better than the pay in basketball and you don't get fired as often. So I kind of <laughs> fell into the law business, but I still coach. I'm the longest tenured uh, volleyball coach in the state of Tennessee, having done it for over 40 years now. Um, and judges have to make decisions. I think that you have to have a demeanor of civility with the attorneys that practice before you, and I think that you have to have a comprehensive, broad-based knowledge of the law. I've tried criminal cases. I've tried attempted murder cases. Um, I would say, even over the district attorney friend that is applying, I've tried more jury trials in a criminal setting. Uh, I've tried way more civil trials. You have to know how it works and have a broad-based uh, understanding of the process, but you've got to be kind to both the litigants and respectful of the attorneys who have an equal role in the process. I've been in the trenches. All of us who've tried cases have been there where a judge gets on your bad side and you just have to take it. And I think that I bring a, a patience, a demeanor, uh, hopefully a, a kindness and a humbleness that you can make a decision because I think at the end of the day, you need a judge who will make the final call, that will make a tough decision and go. Um, this would be a position of service for me. Uh, I have no political aspirations. I've never tried to, to climb the political totem pole. I was asked by several members when Judge Elledge became ill to step forward and do this, and that's what I'm doing, and I would be honored to be the judge for this judicial district. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached that point in our proceedings where I want, would like to invite any member of the public present 
uh, who wishes to speak in opposition to any of these candidates to come forward and identify yourself. Uh, uh, as they say in other settings, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Seeing no one rushing to the podium, uh, the applicants can now breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Momentarily, uh, we'll, we'll move on now to our interviews, and Mr. Spitzer, I invite you to come back up, and I believe that Commissioner Perkey is going to begin the questioning. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, Mr. Spitzer. Are these morning, automatically on? I think they must be. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to Morristown to uh, meet with me recently, and we had a good conversation there in the district attorney's office. And um, as I, I told you, that I really wanted our our get together to be a conversation, and I think uh, our chairman has reiterated that we want this to be a comfortable setting here this morning. So it's it's my privilege to uh, start the questioning. Um, if you would, just just tell us how you got to this point in your life. Um, just three to five major points. How, how did you get here from, from your beginnings? Sure. Uh, well, much like Mr. Cantrell, I didn't start out on this, path, on this path. I was in ROTC in high school, planned to go to the military, thought I wanted to be a doctor, became a medic, um, kind of on that path. Started out a little junior college and took my first political science class from a man named, a professor uh, named Dr. Fry. And he was a big burly fellow with a beard and he was really passionate about our founding fathers and many of those were lawyers. And that was a point where I just fell in love with the law and the history and, and trying to figure out the best modes of government. And I sort of changed my path. Um, moved on to a four year college, worked nights in a factory um, to get through that while I was serving in the National Guard and then moved on to Vanderbilt. Um, got accepted to all three universities, uh, the, uh, Tennessee, Memphis, and um, Vanderbilt, and um, went on to Vanderbilt, um, got out. I just knew I was gonna do civil work. You know, I figured they'd put me in a basement somewhere working for some partner and they'd be piping in air and light and I'd just do research all the time. Um, but went back to my little hometown, um, and ended up doing you know, general civil practice, whatever came through the door. So we had divorces and bankruptcy, and, and um, you know, I even had a, a, a case involving an airplane crash where the police were looking for a fellow and, and, and went by the little local airport and said, hey, can you guys help us? We need a plane. Well, of course, that turned into a plane crash and litigation and um, kind of a big mess. But after doing that for a while, I had a lot of friends and, and um, fraternity brothers and that sort of thing that were in law enforcement, you know, sheriff's department, secret service, all that sort of thing. I decided uh, one of my good friends is here actually, Brian Gillum, who was already working as a prosecutor. And um, I thought I would, would, would like to do that. Um, so I applied statewide and Anderson County uh, General Clark gave me a call. I came up here and interviewed with him. And next thing I knew I was relocating to, to Anderson County. Um, fell in love, met my wife up here, fell in love with her and we've got two beautiful boys and this is home. And you, you briefly introduced your, your, your wife this morning. T tell us about your family. Yes, sir. Uh, both in Humboldt and, and just tell us a little bit. One of the things the commission likes to do is to get to know the candidates. So tell us a little about your family. Sure. Um, you know, I've got a big, a big family out in West Tennessee. Lots of aunts and uncles and cousins. You know, Fourth of July is a big deal at my grandmother's house <laughs> before she passed. Um, you know, like a lot of people, I've had some tragedies in my life. Um, my mother passed away when I was 10. Um, she took her own life with my shotgun the day I taught her how to use it. Um, and that was a real life defining moment for me. Um, something I hadn't actually planned to talk about today, but, um, you know, God takes away from you and then God gives back to you sometimes if you have the eyes to see it. And I was lucky enough to have a grandmother in my life who, who really helped raise me. Um, I had several uncles who helped me stay on the right path, one of whom got me in the National Guard. He was my recruiter. Um, and had it not been for them, you know, I might be on the other side from the DA's office at this point in my life. Um, but I moved up here. I met Tracy in court, actually. She was a probation officer, and she and I... We're watching Judge Layton, I think he's here also. Um, 
we had one of those police officers who didn't know when to keep his, not to argue with the judge. Um, so Judge Layton was blistering him pretty good and Tracy and I were, were kind of watching that show and I went out in the hallway to talk to somebody else and I jotted down my phone number and unbeknownst to me, she did exactly the same thing in the courtroom. So when we walked back in, we exchanged numbers and, and, and it's, been, it's been a crazy ride since then. I've got two little boys, nine and six, and they go to school in Oak Ridge. And um, I'm joined also by Tracy's parents, Patty and Ron Shelton, um, who've been absolutely fantastic. And, and I don't know of anybody that fights harder for me or defends me stronger than my mother-in-law, so. <laughs> Mr. Spitzer, you, um, like a lot of us have in, in the past, if you've been an elected office, you gotta put your name on a ballot uh, to be a judge. Um, along the uh, along that vein, if, is a judge a politician? Talk a little bit about that. In a short answer, absolutely not. You know, it's somewhat unfortunate that in many counties across the state, we have to go through a partisan election. Um, you know, it gives the, the public a, a greater insight into our leanings by knowing, you know, our party loyalties and, and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, we're prohibited by the rules from holding any kind of office in a party. Um, and that applies to candidates, you know. Um, I had some folks talking to me about taking on the role of chair of the Republican Party recently, you know, and I, that was just something I couldn't do because I'm not allowed to do that. Um, I think when you're a judge, you know, your obligation is to focus on the law and the cases in front of you and the political dynamics are something that really shouldn't be in your consideration. It's part of why judges get eight year terms instead of four or two. And I've talked to people about that on the campaign trail. They're like, well, we don't see y'all all the time. We only come up every eight years and that's to try to insulate us some from the ups and downs of politics. It's why federal judges are appointed for life. Um, so I think even though we have to kind of go through this trial by fire to get elected, um, once, once we're there, we have to sort of abandon all of that and focus on the work. Obviously, in your role as an assistant uh, district attorney, you've, you deal with the death penalty. Um, Tennessee is a death penalty state. What are your views on the death penalty? Just talk a little bit about how you feel about the death penalty. Sure. Mine is a secular position. Whether I'm a prosecutor or a judge or any other position of service, you know, I have a job and a responsibility for the county and for the state and my personal views are not really material to that. I'm Catholic, so I'm supposed to be opposed to the death penalty because the Pope and the church are. Um, but I'm also a Tennessean and a Republican and a good old boy from West Tennessee. And I just assume we have the fast track system that Texas has got instead of having appeals that drag on for decades. Um, neither of those two opinions really matter to me when I'm at work. Because when I'm working, it's about what does the law say, what's the right thing to do, and, and how do we accomplish that. And, and my per personal sentiments don't really factor into it. One of the things about this appointment at this particular time is if you're appointed, you're going to have to run for the position fairly quickly sure. and put together a, a campaign to do so. Uh, just talk a little bit about what your intentions are. If you are appointed, do you intend to run for the position? If you're not appointed, do you intend to run for the position? I intend to run regardless. I've already appointed a treasurer. I have billboards up. You may have seen them as you came into town. Um, I've got a commercial already. Um, I'm rolling. I've been out working the county fair all week. Um, that's, that's just part of the process. May's going to get here before we know it. I think we're 289 days away from the May 3rd Republican primary, so I'm all in and, and doing two tracks at once, kind of like how the United States plans to be able to fight a war on both fronts, Atlantic and Pacific. I got to do both things at one time, and here we are. As you know, we have three branches of government. They're, they're very distinct in what they do. Uh, sometimes those lines are, are grayed, as we know, and we've seen in particular in, in recent years um, if you're a judge on the bench and something comes out of the legislature, the legislative branch of government, and you just don't agree with it, uh, or maybe, maybe it's a law that's been on the books for a while and you just don't agree, is it appropriate for a judge to 
make public comments about that um, either when something is before them or when something is not before them. Talk a little bit about how you feel about that. You know, I think we're all well-educated people and we can all see when the legislature does something, we may have our own opinions about whether that's good or bad in the long term from a policy perspective, whatever. Um, I don't think it's a judge's role to comment on that, certainly not publicly. You may in the background, you know, we've had here in Anderson County, we've had interchange judges coming in, um, thank goodness, from nearby counties to help us keep things moving a little bit since Judge Elledge's retirement. And, you know, one of them said to me, was raising questions about the $2,000 mandatory fines and the way we do a lot of different counts here in Anderson County on our indictments. And, but he was very kind and respectful about that and just sort of inquisitive and curious and not making a political statement about it, you know. And I think those kinds of legitimate inquiries into, well, you know, because if you, if you have somebody with, that's under the poverty guidelines and they've got the public defender appointed and they've got six felony drug counts and you stack $2,000 fines for every one of those counts, there's no reasonable expectation they're ever going to be able to pay that, you know. And they can set up a payment system with the clerk and they can whittle at that at $25 a month in perpetuity, you know, but they're never really going to be able to, to, to get out from under that kind of debt. Um, so even with that judge here, I found some opportunities to waive some of those mandatory minimum fines on people that had the public defender appointed and were indigent, you know, by all accounts. Um, I think there's some room to do those kinds of things when you're not entirely comfortable about how some of the laws play out on the ground. Um, but, you know, a judge's law responsibility is to interpret and apply the law. And we, our commentary on what the legislature in Nashville does is not necessary and not really welcome, and it's important we stay in our lane. We're in a, um, at the end, or uh, some would say we're, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. You know, obviously our, our cases are still there. Uh, the numbers are going up recently. We're coming out of COVID. The judiciary is coming out of COVID. Uh, we know there are backlogs in the districts. So time management's going to be very important. Talk a little bit about how, in your mind, you handle time management in the position that you're in, and how would you handle time management to make sure the docket moves if you're appointed to the bench? Sure. I think that's a question both of my own personal time management and then also how do I keep things moving in the courts. Um, you know, Judge Ellers was here at 6.30 the end of the morning and just worked phenomenally hard making sure that, that everything was done right. And you could, one of the best things about practicing in front of him was you could have absolute confidence he was going to know the case, read your pleadings, read whatever case laws you submitted. He was going to know that case before he got on the bench. You weren't going to have to educate him once you got into the courtroom about what the case is about or what the law says. He knows it. And I think it's imperative that I be prepared to put that kind of time and effort into it to be ready whenever I'm hearing cases, whether they're civil or criminal, to put the time in. Um, in the courtroom, you'll, you'll never find a bigger fan of fellow attorneys than me. You know, when we have new lawyers coming in from out of county or junior lawyers that have never really been in our courts before, I'm the guy telling them, okay, you need to make sure you know page and line number because that's how the judge wants to know about what case you're on. And don't forget, you need these plea papers because you got to type all this up ahead of time for the way we do pleas. It's different than what they do in Knox County. You need to be prepared for that because I don't want any of my fellow attorneys getting their heads bit off, you know, because they're not prepared, right? Um, but at the, and I recognize that attorneys oftentimes have to be in two or three courts in the same day. You may have a case here in Anderson. You may have a case in Blunt. You may have to run up to Campbell County and see General Pelzari. Um, but <clears throat> so you try to be accommodating to that. But at the same time, if you're not careful, attorneys will kick the can, you know, and keep sort of churning your docket and resetting, resetting, resetting. And so it's important that you put limits on that. And you say, okay, this is the third time this case has been before me for a plea set deadline. We need to go ahead and set this case for trial. One way or the other, we need to get this thing done. Because sometimes you can't get attorneys, either prosecutors or defense attorneys, to really pay attention to that case until there's a real deadline like a jury trial. And sometimes the defendant won't even get serious about entertaining a plea offer until there's the deadline of a jury trial. Because as long as they're out running the streets, you know, 
taking a plea that especially something that involves split confinement or some jail time, you know, is not something they're going to be eager to look at until they have to. So there's a lot of tools the judge has to use to sort of drive that process. There's a word that we use or we hear used frequently these days. And sometimes I think it's misinterpreted, but the word injustice, when you hear somebody say either in the media or otherwise that, uh, well, I've been the victim of an injustice. What does that mean to you? What does that word mean to you? I think in its truest form, it means that something horrendous or inappropriate under the law has actually happened and needs some remedy just from a sense, just from a straight up justice standpoint. And I think that's what the term really is meant to mean. Now, some people may use that term because what they really mean is they're unhappy with the outcome. You know, somebody got too much jail time, somebody got not enough jail time, somebody got a reduced conviction or, or a judgment wasn't adequate um, or a judgment was too, um, uh, was too heavy. Um, some folks will use the term injustice um, to mean really that they're just dissatisfied with the outcome. But I think what's really hugely important when you're a prosecutor or when you're a judge, when, you're, when your obligation is to justice in its truest form, I think you have to take the time to look at that case, to really, really, really look into it and see, you know, is there, was there really a transgression here somewhere that we need to go back and undo? Did somebody not get an opportunity to be heard? Was there some Batson violation in the jury pool? You know, like wh what kind of problem do we have? Is there something here that really does need to be redressed or is it just, you know, a dissatisfaction with the final outcome? We're almost finished, Ms. Mr. Spitzer. You're, you're sitting as a judge and you have a case before you. And five or 10 minutes into it, 15 minutes into it, you realize that there's an attorney that's woefully unprepared for whatever reason. You, may not, you don't know the reason, but they are just not prepared that day. Um, they're not giving their client good advice. They're not representing their client well. Is that something that you would just let play out? Or how would you deal with that if, if you're a judge on the bench? I think you got to watch how that unfolds very carefully. And, you know, if this is an attorney and you've, you've seen them before and you know their level of competence and for some reason they're just really subpar for what they are normally capable of, I think at some point you probably want to have a recess, a jury out hearing, you probably want to call those two attorneys up and, and, and make some inquiries about, you know, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, are you, are you feeling okay today? Have you had enough time to, to really look at this case and be ready for this? Do we need to have a continuance? Um, you know, you, you may not know whether there's some, you know, personal grief issue, some mental health issue, some, you know, um, just work overload situation. Um, I'd be really concerned about ineffective assistance of counsel, some fundamental defect that that, that that performance drops to such a low level that it's gonna undermine the confidence in the verdict. You know, at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that, that, um, that the cases have been presented well and that the jury's had an opportunity to make a, <laughs> make a legitimate determination and that this defendant or this civil litigant has not had such subpar performance um, that it fundamentally skews the process. Final question, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, if appointed to the bench, what are your aspirations uh, beyond this position, if any? You may not have any, but um, you know, generally we think down the road where we might be in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. What are your aspirations uh, beyond this if you're appointed to the bench? Sure. I really don't have any. I, I'm not, I don't have any grand plans to be governor. I'm not a lifetime politician. You know, this is, this is just not something that I'm into. Um, I'd much rather be at home throwing the football with my boys or working on my Jeep than, than in this political mess, you know? Um, but this is part of the process. You have to go through it. Um, I operate really from a sense of duty with, with how I do my job now, you know? The power I have as a prosecutor to put people in jail or probation or dismiss chases, whatever, you know, none of that belongs to me. It belongs to the people, and I'm, I'm serving a purpose and, and trying to help make my community better and safer. 
Um, and when I saw that Judge Elledge was retiring, um, you know, there needs to be someone on that bench who's ready to move this county forward. And, you know, I've got a tremendous amount of experience. I live here in Anderson County. I've run for Sessions Court Judge in the past. Um, and so it was sort of an opportunity that I needed to step up to. Um, you know, my plan had always been to run for DA later on. My boss is 10 years older than me. And when he finishes his time, I had planned to sort of step into that. Um, but with the situation we have now with this COVID backlog and, and the urgency that we have to get this process moving, this was something I needed to step up to. Mr. Spitzer, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Lancaster. Uh, yes, sir. First of all, I need to say something. It's being recorded, and if some of my family may be watching, I'm a new grandfather, first time grandfather. So I have to say that. Congratulations. Because otherwise, I might get, I can't imagine they're watching this. But anyway, <laughs> they have a life, Ed, okay? <laughs> Two of them don't right now. They have no life. Um, they, uh, I did have a question um, a lifelong prosecutor. So, how will the defense bar? see you on the bench you know i'm fortunate to have a really good working relationship with all the defense bar here in Anderson County, and the attorneys that come over here usually from knoxville um one of my letters of recommendation was from a local longtime defense attorney um, and he was an absolute pit bull in his prime and oak ridge officers would tremble at the prospect of having to do a preliminary hearing with him but he and i have always had a very good working relationship and i have that with the, the entire defense bar. Um, I think they have confidence in me that I'm going to give them full and complete disclosure. Um, we do open file discovery. You know, um, we disclose Giglio when we have it. You know, we, um, so I work very hard to be fair and professional and always have an open door, always be welcome to have a defense attorney come in and talk to me. Um, one of my friends, fellow attorney, defense, one of my defense attorney friends was commenting the other day about, you know, he knew he could always just come and talk to me and sit down and say, here's my client's perspective. Here's what I'd like for you to consider doing. We didn't always agree. I don't give away the farm, um, but sometimes there's room to maneuver there. You know, a little less jail time, a little more probation. And, you know, maybe their court costs is the main thing they're concerned about. Having that willingness to just be open and talk, um, I think makes the process work better. So you're on the bench, and uh, I think you mentioned it, it's a heavy criminal code, uh, criminal uh, docket. But the very first case you have is a complicated civil matter, contractual experts, competing experts, all sorts of, uh, of fact-specific and also statutory type of things, but it's all civil. How do you deal with that? I think that file is going home with me. <laughs> I think it's going to be a very long night, and I hope I got plenty of coffee at the house. Um, you know, there may be a necessity to reach out to a fellow judge if I get to a sticky issue, you know, um, and say, hey, you know, I've got this particular um, modified comparative fault kind of problem. You know, and, and what, do we, what do we need to, you know, I'm struggling with the application of this particular issue and, and call up a, a fellow judge and, and get some guidance or some help with that. Um, you know, the, I think the rules require that a judge issue a prompt decision. You know, you can take it under advisement, but you only have, I think, 60 days in which you need to issue an order. Um, so you need to uh, familiarize yourself just as quickly as you can with all of the applicable law and the case and the specifics and take all of that in. And if you're not able to make that decision in the moment, at least be able to go back and very quickly research that so that the parties can move forward with their case. Thank you. Uh, you're not unusual. I was noticing a lot of people from West Tennessee that moved to this area. Uh, my history and my company work statewide. And we always had a rule. We could get people from East Tennessee to move to the middle and maybe stay. But even though they'd say they'd move to West Tennessee, they'd never stick. They'd always come <laughs> back. And, uh, but that wasn't true the other way. So there you are. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your application. Thank you. Mr. North. Well, Mr. Spitzer. Morning. Did you ever deal with uh, Floyd flipping over in Humboldt? Oh, yeah. I know Floyd. His office was on Main Street right by Union Planners Bank. Good friend. Good golfing buddy. Yes, sir. Tell me this. How are cases assigned for this particular court? You mentioned 80% of the docket is criminal. 
how do divorces get assigned? How do car accident cases get assigned? Sure. Um, my understanding is that the divorce domestic all goes to chancery um, and that the circuit court hears the personal injury type cases, contract disputes, that sort of thing. Um, all the criminal cases find their way into this circuit court. So everything from the two sessions, courts that get bound over, all the direct presentments, that sort of thing. So you never have to deal with any uh, divorce issues or orders of protection, anything like that? I've not seen those in the circuit side here in front of Judge Elledge. Um, there may be some issues with Chancellor Cantrell if she has some kind of conflict and Judge Elledge needs to hear that. Um, but I'm not aware of him making a routine practice of that. In your experience, how many jury trials have you tried? Uh, probably eight or ten as civil, I mean as criminal, and then I had some bench trials on the civil side when I was in private practice. Well, thank you for your application. I appreciate you participating in this process. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Wallace. There are people from Humboldt, there are also people from Dyersburg, so it's not that strange. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or, or at least maybe not 100% strange. So mm -hmm. let, me, let me expound a little bit, if I could, on a prosecutor sitting as judge in a criminal setting. Let me, let, let's expand it a little bit. You're also a KA. You're also a member or were a member of the Federalist Society. You're also, I assume you're still in the Knights of Columbus. Yes, sir. Okay. And you've been a prosecutor. Yes, sir. I'm a crazy sovereign citizen coming to your courtroom. I accuse you of everything under the sun. How are you going to react? We've actually had a similar situation to that here. <laughs> um, we had a, we had a, um, a, a, guy, a gentleman who ran over somebody and killed them at the fair several years back, and he was one of those um, sovereign citizen type folks and was filing liens against the judge and the DA on their houses, and, you know, it was a train wreck. Um, you have to hope that you can talk that person into taking counsel first, right? Hope that they will hire a lawyer, hope that they will accept the appointment of a lawyer and that they're not proceeding pro se because that has all its own complications, right? Um, and then I think you have to watch for any kind of allegations or aggressiveness from that person that would put me in a position that I felt like I might have a recusal issue. Right? So if they're filing liens on my personal property or anything like that, that creates an automatic conflict or recusal situation for me, I think I'd have to be very sensitive to that. Um, otherwise, I think we, we try to progress the case, whatever that is, whatever it is he's charged with. Um, well, how are you going to counter, uh, well, you work with Bill Koch, and he's a fellow prosecutor like you were, and you're just going to take his side on everything because I don't want this public defender because we know they're useless to represent me. Sure. So I, I'm, I'm trying to get your, your demeanor coming back from somebody, and, yeah, I'm not <clears throat> pounding on the table or screaming at you right now like they probably will. Sure. Um, because you've got a very good demeanor with us right now, and, and, and I want to compliment you on that. Your, your wife and your mother-in-law have done a very good job of training you. I'm taken to my training, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, so and as, as Chairman Koch said, we will be humorous when we need to, but the situation I've just put you in is, in, is something that's going to happen. We are in eastern part of the state and there are some people that get a little upset with authority mm -hmm. uh, like they do in my home county of Socialist Republic of Davidson County uh, <laughs> uh, or in West Tennessee where they just sort of don't pay any attention to much of anything anyway so help me out so I think I'd have to say 
Mr. So-and-so, you're right, I did serve as a prosecutor, but I've stepped away from that, that and, and I've been elected to this position, hopefully appointed and then elected to this position as judge, and I owe no obligations and I have no lasting connections to the DA's office, and I can assure you you're gonna be fairly treated in my courtroom. Um, secondly, most of the judges that you would set in front of around the state, they're either gonna be former defense attorneys, former prosecutors, or former, former civil attorneys. You know, they're gonna come from one of those three backgrounds, more than likely. Um, and so if I were to recuse, you may just as well get Judge Short or Judge Hickson out of Knox County, both of whom are former prosecutors. As a matter of fact, I think Judge Green may have been a prosecutor before he was a civil defense attorney. Um, so in a lot of situations, you're gonna encounter judges that are former prosecutors, but that doesn't mean that that has any bearing at all on how we handle your case. And my obligation now today is to make sure that the law is followed and that you're treated fairly and that your rights are protected. Now I'd encourage you to get an attorney and talk to them about the prospect of filing some kind of motion to recuse if you feel like that's necessary. Um, or I'll give you time to go out and hire an attorney and you can talk to your attorney about the prospect of filing a motion to recuse. And if you wanna do that, then I'll, I'll consider it. And if I decide not to recuse, I'm obligated to state in writing my reasons for why I've chosen not to recuse. But that's a process we're gonna have to work through. First thing today, you need to get a lawyer, you need to have an opportunity to talk to them. I'm gonna leave the questions concerning the canons and what have you to the chairman when it comes back to him. I'm not gonna steal your questions this time. Um, let me ask you, you've already set up a committee. Yes, sir. And you've already filed all your stuff with the Registry of Election Finance and- I have, yes, sir. Who did you establish as your treasurer? My treasurer is uh, Lauren Belosky. She's a local defense attorney. Um, she ran for juvenile court in the last election cycle. Um, she and her close friend, uh, Channing Miller, have a thriving um, domestic practice here in Anderson County. Okay. Well, one of the things that I think most of the lawyers up here think about is rogue fever. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, and you've, I'm sure, gone to other places, and and someone like myself, actually, if it's a criminal court matter, if I'm in your courtroom at that time, I'm lost. So you need to help me go where I belong. With my last name, especially, I'm not going to be in that courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> However, how are you going to make me feel, or? Mr. North or Ms. Now, well, you're more of a, you're sort of local. How are you going to make us feel when we come in here that we're not going to get home cooked in a civil matter? Real important to some of us. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, I have great working relationships with attorneys from out of county and am always really respectful and conscientious with them and try to treat them the same as I would any local attorney and probably go a little further in trying to make sure they don't step on any landmines about how we do things here in Anderson County. Um, home, home cooking is something you always worry about even in civil practice back in West Tennessee, you know, when I'd go to some other county that I didn't normally practice in, you know, that, that would always be on your radar. Um, you know, and the, there's a lot of terms for, you know, black robitis and, and all of that. Um, and uh, that's why I wanted to make sure I made that point earlier about how none of this authority belongs to me. I think it's important to have this sense of humility um, that, that, you know, I'm not some fancy aristocrat that everybody's got to bow down to. I mean, if I'm a judge, what that really means is I have this elevated authority. I mean, elevated obligation an elevated sense of duties to make sure this entire process plays out correctly and fairly in my court. And that includes making sure that home cooking is not a problem. COVID has taught us that we don't necessarily need to be in the courtroom like some of us grew up in, um, that we can have remote hearings or 
God forbid we can have computers and actually file pleadings late at night when and beat deadlines. Uh, so I usually start going down the questions of, you know, do you have electronic filings here? Now, I don't know on the criminal side, I have to admit I don't practice that type of law. Don't even want to understand it. Um, <laughs> Just know I like I, I don't like it, I don't want to do it, and I certainly don't want to be in court with it, um, or I'm guilty of malpractice. Uh, but do you have electronic filing here? The short answer is no. We allow facsimile filing. I'm familiar with electronic, which is very rare and very annoying, but I'm familiar with electronic filing having done bankruptcy court in West Tennessee. and. West Tennessee, oddly enough, has an extremely high um, caseload of bankruptcy cases. I don't know what it is about the, the western uh, part of the George state. George Stevenson, he likes to have fifth time before he gets upset with them. <laughs> it's okay. It's not a problem. Right. Um, you know, electronic, everything's moving electronic. We've done court by Zoom. We've got special hardware set up with the jail so we can do that. Um, but when you're, when you're in the criminal setting, and even for the civil on the state side, you know, you're going to have people that just don't have those kind of electronic resources, you know. And if they need to come in and file a pauper's oath or some kind of, you know, personal filing, I know they're considering letting victims take out warrants for assaults and that sort of thing here instead of the officers doing it. Um, there's, there's a lot of things where the access to the court process would be hindered if we were fully electronic, if they didn't also have some paper alternative. So as we go forward over the next 20 or 30 years towards the end of my time as an attorney, um, we're likely to see more and more electronic progression, um, but we have to make sure we keep accommodations for people who don't have the means to do that. I'm happy to answer more questions if that caused more. No, triggered no, more. no, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it's a, the mindset of someone coming in that spends most of their time in the, the federal system or in the big city um, is, is a little bit different. I happen to like the pace a little bit better in this part of the, in, in the setting that you practice in. So don't, don't take my, my eyes opening a little bit more or closing or rolling or what have you in any way, <laughs> shape or form. Well, I, well Take, for example, orders of protection. You know, if, someone, if, if, if someone's been victimized at home and they feel like they need to go get an order of protection, for a lot of folks it's a real struggle just to even know where to go. You know, and we, we would try to direct them to the court clerk's office and there's a little packet for them to fill out to say, you know, who it is they want that order of protection from and sort of the basic circumstances of what happened. But, but for, po for folks with very limited means and sometimes with, with um, limited education or background, um, if that were to somehow be some all electronic system or you had to go online and try to do that somehow, that would, that would be a burden and a hindrance and maybe reduce their access to the court. Actually, you've done a good job of answering my questions, so <laughs> we're going to quit while you're ahead. How about that? I appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have no questions. I'm at 18, I'm getting close. <laughs> always very well prepared on the law. I mean, there, he, there was no question about it. He may ask me about a case I didn't even know about, okay? And one of the things that you put in your application was you said, I've had the freedom to pursue justice for its own sake without the obligations of a traditional client. And I get that, but sometimes when you're the judge 
And we all like to think that justice is always done, and that's the ultimate goal for all of us. But what if what the law tells you to do is not, in your mind, what justice is in a particular case, be it criminal or be it civil? How do you handle that? I am not free to step out from whatever the law says. Um, you know, the, the process in the court system can be messy sometimes. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, we're, we're making sausage, you know, um, and you may not be happy with the final outcome. You may not be happy with the final jury verdict. You may not be necessarily happy with whatever plea is happening in front of you or whatever um, civil agreement they've come to, uh, but you're, you're obligated first, foremost, and always to follow the law. And I don't think any judge on any level all the way up to the United States Supreme Court has the freedom to step out from whatever the law requires. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I don't have anything further. Thank you. The uh, Humboldt has a ripples that spread out all over the state, and, and I've been to Humboldt. Uh, I'm a frequent flyer at the Strawberry Festival, and a very uh, distinguished Humboldt native Jerry Griggs and I had the privilege of serving in Governor Alexander's cabinet 20 plus plus <laughs> year, years ago. So uh, uh, Humboldt's a good place to be from as far as I'm concerned. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I want to just basically ask you two questions. They're follow up to some questions you've already had. And, and first, uh, Commissioner Perkey asked you about commenting on the law. Uh, and and I, your answers were perfectly appropriate. I have, agree with them, have no objection to them. But, uh, you know, uh, a judge is a judge not only when they're on the bench, but when they're off the bench, you know, whether in, in church, whether in the grocery store. And, and uh, judges, and if you become one, you'll find that you are an influencer. What you say matters. And so there are going to be folks uh, who are not trying to draw you out, they're not trying to trap you, but they just really want to know what you think. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do with, when that arises? I think you it might be at the civic club, it might be at church. I mean, sure. Um, I think you got to get comfortable saying, you know, I, I really am not allowed to comment on that. You know, I, I really shouldn't voice an opinion on that one way or the other. Um, I know that the rules require that a judge behave with the same professionalism and um, um, respectful demeanor in all settings, not just while you're on the bench or in the courtroom, but throughout your personal life as well. Um, you know, I commented on having to go through this trial by fire political process to win an election, you know, but on the, and so now you've got to have a Facebook page, you know, and you've got to do all the things, right? But then on the back end, you need to shut all that down because like you say, you don't need to give any worrisome perspectives to the public or say or do anything at all that might cause people to have concerns about your impartiality. We have a, uh, not necessarily in Tennessee, but it's very common now for, for active judges to have Facebook pages and Twitter accounts and things like that. It sounds like you're, you're gonna be cyber celibate if you get on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that no matter what you do or say, somebody's gonna take issue with it. Sure. And, and that's just part of it. And so the less you do or say, the less ammunition you give folks to take shots at with you later. I agree with you. Uh, but let me change the f scenario a little bit. Sure. Uh, as, a, as a sitting trial judge, you're going to have lawyers, whether it's in criminal or civil proceedings, formally challenging the constitutionality of state statute, procedural, substantive, whatever it is. You're, you're going to face those questions. Uh, uh, and, and we've recently experienced a circumstance where a judge deciding a difficult question came very close to being removed from the bench because her decision was not popular. Uh, and not surprisingly, I think, to anyone in this room or to anyone else, that that, that procedure has a lot of judges looking over their shoulder. So you're, you're on the bench now. You're Going, uh, you're, you, you are a defense attorney challenges the constitutionality of a, of a statute. How are you going to handle that? I think your first 
obligation is to look at the canons of construction, the legislative history, to dig into the meat of, you know, were these issues and concerns vetted back when we went through the legislative process? You know, what can I find that's going to try to help me answer this, you know? Um, and if all that is sort of unclear, murky, you can't get a good sense of what it is the legislature was doing or there's some um, legitimate constitutional question, I think you've got to try to, you know, stack up canons and, you know, um, uh, look at, try to make your best legislative determination. You know, our first obligation as judges is to do what the legislature intended, and, and we only get to, you know, get further down into the process if, if it's not clear what they did, you know. Um, so I try to work through that very carefully um, and try not to make any messes for the Court of Appeals above me, if I can help it. So as, as Chief Justice Roberts has said, you're just going to call the balls and the strikes? Absolutely. Have you figure out what the strike zone is? The, uh, uh, we also, uh, Mr. Lawless asked you about technology. And, and, of course, you're in some ways fortunate to be in a one-county judicial district. But uh, there are multi-county judicial districts, that, and I'm sure you know prosecutors and public defenders that practice in some of those districts, where they spend a lot of time on the highway driving to the clerk's office to get a record when they could be in their office doing their job. So, I mean, there are technological advances like digitizing the court records, where even it would be helpful here if, if, uh, if you all could, you know, even on the weekend, if you can get on your computer and get a record rather than having to schlep it around in a big file. So would you agree that there may be some technological advances like that that would be helpful that could be promoted? Absolutely. Um, we've been very fortunate here in Anderson County. Um, Rex Lynch, who I think was here earlier. Oh, there's Angie. She helps y'all get set up. Um, their office has done a phenomenal job. Uh, every document that gets filed in this court gets immediately scanned in. It's available electronically on the database. You can see all the court settings. You can see the history of the court settings and the history of the pleadings and all of it right there. And you can access that from home. Um, the state IT department for the district attorney general's conference has done a really good job of getting us laptops and setting us up so that we can work remotely when we need to. Um, and, and, the more we can use technology and the more we can get away from paper, the better. Our office does open file discovery, and we normally do that by giving either a CD or a USB drive to defense counsel. We scan it all, and we make it available digitally. We know exactly what we've given, and it's easy for us to reproduce it if we need to. Well, uh, I, I suspected that of all the counties in the state, Anderson County would be one that does not have a bunch of Luddites in it, that if you've got the money and the technology, you're going to use it. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, answers to our questions. Appreciate your candor. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Thank you all. Do you all want to take a break? I think it's a capital suggestion. A capital Chairman. suggestion. Then we will, we, it is 20 after 10, we'll Thank break for 10 minutes. Thanks, sir.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to continue. Uh, and for some of you that may be wondering, we've all been trying to raise these chairs because we all feel like we're hiding behind the bench. Uh, and we're, we're not ducking and covering. We just, we just can't get any higher than, than we are now. <laughs> well, actually, I, th I think they've put the go. bulletproofing on the bench. So <laughs> that they've done that. We've all learned to duck and roll over the years because the bench is safe. I don't think we're going to have that problem today. Uh, Ms. Crutchfield, uh, please come forward. Welcome. And I believe that uh, Mr. Lancaster is going to begin the questioning today. Good morning. Good morning. Ms. Crutchfield, we had a great conversation last week. I'm sorry we didn't get to, a chance to meet in person. I kind of picked you up as the second, as your second, but um, I'm very pleased that we did. Um, I, we talked a good bit about um, the position itself, and uh, there's already been discussion about um, how much of the work is uh, criminal, but just describe uh, what most qualifies you for this particular trial court position. Well, I think there are three main things, uh, qualities. Um, my life experience, my legal experience, and my leadership experience. I think those three things are the qualities uh, that most, well, qualify me for this position. Um, I've practiced primarily in civil litigation. I'm familiar with, with jury trials and jurors, although the majority of cases these days uh, in my line of work, primarily on the defense, uh, litigation defense side for, for businesses and corporations, um, the best outcome is not always a jury trial. So um, uh, while I have litigation experience, it's largely pretrial and motion practice, and that type of things, but I, ha I do have jury trial experience that I think is, is critical uh, to understanding that it's not just uh, it's not just about the law. There's a lot of different components to a jury trial. There's uh, things behind the scenes that most people will never see. The with the circuit court clerks, the pretrial conferences, the expert <coughs> qualifications, motions in limine, things like that. That a lot of people, if you're not in the profession, don't don't think about. My life experience uh, is important, but I think, because I would not have been applying uh, to be a judge 10 years ago or, or maybe five years ago. I think there's a level of maturity that you need and a level of, <clears throat> excuse me, life experience that um, helps you see things, gives you perspective that... Um, your client's case is your client's case. You do your best as an advocate. As a judge, you're not an advocate. It, you're applying the law to the facts that are presented or calling uh, uh, the referee side if the, in front of it. If it's a bench trial, you're uh, ruling, but if you're in front of a jury, the jury is the trier of fact. Uh, and being able to see that your role, it's not a personal, you don't take it as a, a personal win or loss. Those types of things are, uh, I guess, a little bit, you see that more clearly the older you get and the longer that you practice. The leadership experience, I've, I've had the opportunity to be involved in nonprofit and legal, T-law, et law other legal positions, and I'm uh, familiar with herding cats and herding cats with uh, very differing viewpoints and bringing people together, working collaboratively uh, with, with other people and uh, with different interests for a common purpose, for a common goal, to get things accomplished, to get things done. I think that's very important, and I see the judge role as one of an administrator in a lot of ways. You have to work with the other people that are also involved with the administration of justice. And I think those uh, recognizing that and uh, being able to work collaboratively 
with with others is one of the qualities that I could bring. We discussed um, what's the biggest challenge. You're on this bench. You get appointed. You get appointed. What would you be, be your biggest challenge, and how would you uh, attack it? I think my biggest cra my big biggest challenge will certainly be the criminal law aspect. I am uh, I will be taking all criminal law continuing legal education this year. Um, I've talked to many of my colleagues who practice at the criminal bar uh, about important issues. I've read the most recent laws that went into uh, effect July 1 with the uh, justice reform that the governor has passed and I've spoken with both the DA and uh, David Clark and uh, the public defender and Coria about the uh, important things that they see uh, with the docket and how to move things forward, those types of things. And I will, I'm no stranger to studying and learning very quickly and getting up to speed on complicated issues and complex issues. That reminds me, um, you have a, a, a work comp practice that uh, is heavily statutory now, um, similar to criminal law. Um, and I think, uh, I talked to one of your references about how they recruited you, and they recruited you because of your expertise in that area. How did you become an expert in a relatively, well, it got revised quite a bit in the last 10 years, so in work comp, how did you address becoming um, what they viewed as an expert for their firm to, to bring you in? Well, I had the opportunity when I was with Leitner Williams Julian Napolitan uh, as a senior associate to work on the DOE, Department of Energy and U.S. Department of Labor legacy cases here at Oak Ridge. We, uh, we interviewed and went through the process for a proposal I was familiar with the workers' comp, thanks to uh, Tim Connor, who is now on the Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals Board. And I was not familiar, though, with all the complexities of both the federal and the state workers' compensation laws and occupational claims in general. There's a lot of expertise that was required in understanding beryllium and asbestos and experience. Um, environmental exposure, silica, lung problems, you needed to know uh, exposure limits uh, from NIOSH and various government agencies, the EPA, uh, had to learn uh, industrial health requirements, medical requirements for diagnosis and differential diagnosis, those types of things. And I really enjoyed jumping in and, and learning all of, all of those things. So um, then with the Workers' Compensation Reform Act, both in 2004 and then again in 2013 and 14, um, it's a matter of reading the law, looking at the, the statutes, but a lot of it is expert, expert proof driven with the medical and scientific fields. And so um, that was how I jumped in and um, learned both the, the critical uh, factors in the medical and environmental exposure as well as, as the law. You mentioned this, uh, you've been an advocate and on the bench you would not be an advocate, but describe uh, your courtroom. How would uh, I'd walk in, I have a case, um, what would I expect from your courtroom, from the judge, uh, what would you expect of me, uh, of the participants such as the clients? Uh, be it criminal or civil? One of the things I enjoyed the most about practicing in Anderson County in front of Judge Elledge is he was always prepared. It was, he never, um, he had always looked at your file, he had always read everything that the parties had filed, the briefs. He knew your case and um, would ask questions about it. You, you um, 
and I really appreciated that that he was always prepared and I would want to follow suit and be prepared as well. He was always respectful to everybody who came before him, uh, regardless of the situation, always very nice. And even if he disagreed with your interpretation or your arguments, he very graciously explained why and had a well-reasoned opinion that was founded on, on the law. And I would want to be the same. Uh, I would want I would want to be prepared, predictable, on time. Um, with there's a joke here about Elledge time. If you're you're early, you're on time. If you're um, on time, you're late. Uh, but that was that was something that I really felt um, it was important. You knew that in his courtroom it was going to run um, on time and be respectful of the other parties and the other counsel's time and the, and the, uh, the litigants' time, and I would want to be that way too. At home, they call that Lancaster time. <laughs> <laughs> I um, had one more uh, thought. Um, the, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the talking to and being an administrator of sorts um, do you have any ideas uh, of how to make the legal process more efficient? There was some discussion about electronic filing. Um, but have you thought of some things that you could do um, in your own courtroom without disrupting everybody else or disrupting other people if they're willing to buy into it? Um, of, of things to make, make the court more efficient than it is currently, knowing that there's a backlog, obviously. <clears throat> I think initially, um, if I was appointed, I wouldn't want to make too many changes. I would want to be talking with the circuit court clerk, the the DA, the public defender, those types of things. Judge Elledge had scheduling orders in civil and criminal cases. I think the use of status conferences are, are something that you know help. Uh, but initially, I think um, the uh, I think it would be important to get input from others before making any big changes to the way that the court has run um, with Judge Elledge. Um, his, his protocols and procedures and uh, the local rules. I would certainly want to be talking with, with the other uh, trial judge, um, uh, the chancellor. Uh, about those types of things because here in Anderson County uh, you have to work together and especially on a on a uh, docket backlog that we've we've got uh, that would be something we would want to be working together on those types of th any kind of changes just uh, one final question your um, the <coughs> folks introducing you to this body uh, talked about your work ethic and uh, I think you mentioned uh, something about um, uh, uh, nuclear, but explain to me this tour of France that you had, uh, um, your four-week stay in Paris. I assume you went to school some too, but. Uh, actually, I was, I was in school the whole time. My husband <laughs> got to tour all the museums. <laughs> 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 um, but no, it was, um, I did get to um, see some wonderful sites. Uh, it was, I participated in that program, uh, the OECD nuclear law program, because at that time I was working uh, on the, the DOE legacy um, EEO, ICPA, <laughs> energy employees, um, uh, the, the legacy claims. Uh, rising from the Manhattan Project here in, in Oak Ridge and wanted to better understand the interaction between the nuclear laws that we have and the international uh, guidelines on things like radiation and environmental exposures and not just uh, to get a broader understanding of the, the laws that went into and impacted um, cases here in East Tennessee in Oak Ridge. So it was a very 
learning experience. It, it added to my knowledge for the occupational exposure claims and, and environmental uh, work and that kind of thing. So, but it was a fun, it was also a fun trip. <laughs> I'm sure there are, I have other questions, but I'm confident my other uh, com members of the com uh, commission will answer, ask those of you. But thank you, I've enjoyed this. Thank you. Mr. North. Morning, Ms. Crutchfield. Good morning. Tell me what happened to Sports Bell. I didn't know they were out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, their uniforms over here. Yeah, well, uh, Jesse Lee, the owner, ended up getting in trouble a few years after <laughs> I left. No, I, I went there. They were, as they were expanding and growing in uh, the late 90s, and had the Adidas uh, contract with the University of Tennessee. Um, I went there and um, to help with employee benefits and HR, and quickly learned that uh, in-house counsel was not a cushy <laughs> <laughs> um, job that you know you went home at 5 5 30 and came back at 8 uh, it was a 24 7 job they had they were running shifts at that time and so after uh, a few months I was really missing I felt isolated and uh, uh, really wanted to be back with the practice of law and a firm and um, but uh, years after I I left I had heard that there were some I think there he the Jesse was um, convicted of burning his building down for insurance money so you weren't a reason for their demise <laughs> no I was not I was not <laughs> tell me this you're on the bench and uh, you have uh, an overly aggressive out-of-town lawyer, say like Mr. Lawless. <laughs> <laughs> and you're getting the now young lady treatment. And the fellow or lady, uh, Mr. Jerk, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? I would, I think my first thought would be to maybe have um, a sidebar. Uh, call a recess and have a sidebar and just say okay what's going on <laughs> um, because uh, I if you let things go I found it uh, leads to further disrespect and while I don't want to do anything to embarrass or call out in public in front of a proceeding or anything like that, I think I would just take a quick recess and ask the parties to come up and ask what's what, what what's going on. Um, and as politely and diplomatically as possible, um, explain why I'm feeling there's there's some disrespect here and um, no, you know, no offense, but this is this is why, um, but I don't um, uh, think it would be appropriate just to let that continue without um, making some uh, statement or having some conversation with the lawyer. Mm -hmm. I understand that there's a backlog, obviously, of cases here in, in Anderson County as well as, I guess, all over the world. But would you have the ability to, for example, interchange with the chancellor and, and the days that, for example, the, the uh, case that you had that's uh, uh, settled at the last moment or passed or postponed or whatever, would you have the ability to interchange with the chancellor and perhaps take some of the load off of her docket or vice versa? Do you understand you have, would have that ability? Yes, I would expect that that's one of the, the things that the judges here have done in the past is help each other out. Uh, that uh, Chancellor Lantrop and Buddy Scott and Lantrop and Judge Elledge and um, Judge Elledge and Judge Cantrell today, Chancellor Cantrell today, uh, work together when those, um, uh, to help each other out on those types of things. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned the, uh, the lack of criminal experience. Do you have jury trial experience yourself? Yes, I do. How many jury trials have you tried? I would say I've had about 20 to 25 that have gone, and that would be both with lead and, and um, second chair. Um, the majority of my cases by far settle or are resolved on uh, dispositive motion. And especially here in the last few years with more mediations and more um, alternative dispute resolution matters with arbitration agreements, those types of things. Uh, there's also, I've had many more bench trials just because of the work I've done. And so, um, but jury trial experience is something that's becoming more and more rare by far. Pre-trial pleadings, uh, pre-trial motions, pre-trial practice is, is the large majority of my court appearances. I know in Hamilton County, the jury trial has almost become a dinosaur. And I'll bet you that the, uh, uh, the circuit and chancery courts don't try a dozen jury trials a year. It's amazing. Would you have scheduling orders? Yes. Would your court be set up for, for that? Yes, I think they're very important. I think that helps get deadlines on your, on your calendar and uh, would also uh, pre-trial cases that are going to trial, I believe, need a pre-trial hearing to uh, focus everyone on the issues that need to be addressed, motions in limine on experts or Daubert motions or the uh, jury instructions, all of those things are, are critical, I think, to making the jury process run smoothly and the courtroom to run uh, smoothly. And I understand that the Chancery Court uh, exclusively does the domestic cases, is that correct? No. Um, they tradition Historically, I think there has been the majority of, of the domestic relations cases, estate and probate, those types of things have always been in the chancery court. And, um, but the chancery and circuit court would have the jurisdiction to, to do both. It's just the way it has been set up as, uh, and traditionally historically here in Anderson County and as in many other places, the chancery court is less jury trial focused. Would you seek to con uh, continue that tradition? Or primarily domestic cases in Chancery Court? I think so. That's all I have, Ms. Kirchner. Thank, thank you for participating. You. Thank you, Commissioner Perky. Ms. Crutchfield, uh, thank you for your application. I, I noticed at one time you were with Wimberley Lawson Wright, uh, uh, the firm. Did you know Bill Seal from Morristown? I do. I did not. He was already with uh, Bush Brothers yes. by the time I was with the firm, but I got to know him through the through Christmas parties and um, attorney meetings and, and those types of things. He's a good friend. I serve on the hospital board with him now. So okay. I'll, yes. I'll tell him that we saw each other. Um, I have uh, one unusual question for you. I, I would note that six years ago today, uh, we had a terrorist-inspired event in the state of Tennessee in Chattanooga where we lost four United States Marines and one United States sailor. Um, that's, it's noteworthy because of the date, but in my role in state government, I was the point person for that response for, for Governor Bill Haslam. Obviously, Anderson County has a tremendous role in national security. Uh, with all the federal institutions here. Um, it, it's historically had a role back to the Manhattan Project, and you mentioned earlier you made reference to, to some of that. Um, most of any incursions on national security here would be prosecuted on the federal level. But if there were those that were prosecuted at the state level, talk a little bit about um, Anderson County and Oak Ridge's role in national security and, and how would you uh, look at those cases in general, in general, 
based on the facts and if they're related to national security? Well, I think anything related to national security um, and DOE, they would certainly want the federal authorities to be the one to take the lead on that. Uh, I think the role of the Anderson County Circuit Court would, if there were issues there, it would be tangential to the federal matters um, and perhaps maybe liability or retaliatory discharge. I am familiar with after the, uh, the incident in um, 2012, I believe it was with the break-in. Yes. Um, several people lost their jobs. Um, there were, uh, it had ramifications into some state law sorts of things. So I would say that the impact of the um, circuit court would be more one of um, perhaps the liability, less criminal liability and more civil liability for actions taken or not taken, contractual issues, those types of things. But I think the majority of the, of any fallout from those things would be handled by the federal court. I asked uh, Mr. Spitzer earlier a, a question of, about a word that we used, or we hear used, uh, sometimes loosely in the media these days. and other venues, but the word injustice, uh, if someone says that they've been a victim of injustice, what does that word mean to you and and what what are your thoughts on, on um, what a person may or may not be thinking if they use that word as it relates to the court system? I think I have a broader um, definition of injustice. I think injustice is used a lot of times these days for a broad, uh, not just criminal law injustice, but perhaps feelings of lack of due process, not being heard, not being respected, those types of things, and not necessarily a failure of our justice system, but they people feel that they have rights or they've been disrespected and not had the opportunity to have their grievances addressed in some form or fashion. Um, so uh, I don't uh, view necessarily injustice as a term of art. I think it's certainly used loosely uh, these days for uh, feelings of, of being disrespected and, and marginalized and not having the opportunity to um, express opinions or do something or being treated wrongly without having an opportunity to have that redressed or being heard. So. One other question, if, uh, and I asked this question earlier also, if, if you're on the bench and you have a case before you and a uh, short time into the case, it's clear to you that an attorney is not prepared for whatever reason. You don't know the reason, but it's just clear to you that something's off with, with that attorney and is not advising his, his client well and so forth. How would you handle that as a judge? It would depend on the circumstances and how well I knew the uh, the attorney and I think I would certainly uh, if I thought we were getting into dangerous territory of someone's rights or those kinds of things I would be calling them up we'd be having a sidebar seeing what what needed to be done as far as do we need a continuance do uh, uh, sort of what's going on uh, type of thing I'm not the type of person to to chew someone out or uh, be disrespectful in a whole courtroom of, of people, but I would want to address it and find out what was going on either in chambers or or at a sidebar where we could, um, all parties, because you, when you have a, a, when you're in the middle of a court hearing, you've got other people, you've got all the parties to think of, and the inconvenience and everybody should be prepared 
uh, if it's something that's happening on a routine basis, there's obviously a bigger problem. Uh, but um, with with you know the particular attorney, but if it's something odd or uh, unusual, you you don't want. I, you do think of things like ineffective assistance of counsel or appeals or, or those types of things. You don't want people's um, cases to be jeopardized by an attorney who's who's not prepared for whatever reason. Ms. Crutchfield, thank you so much for your application, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Lawless. I've got a couple of semi personal side questions for you. Okay. Equestrian board? Are you yes. a horse person? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like other people's horses. I do not have horses right now. Um, my mother and stepfather were involved with uh, Tennessee walking horses, and um, then I, uh, my daughter enjoyed riding and uh, through uh, charitable events with uh, STAR and um, the um, Shining Light Equestrian. I was on the boards for therapeutic riding and just riding lessons in general. And, and just so you'll know, we had somebody that was very, very active last time when we were in Montgomery County in, in the horse arena. Is that the, is that the appropriate? And I'm just horse trying to find out horse all horse. of the, yeah. It, 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 you don't falcon, do you? No, I do okay. not. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to go through this because we had a horse person and a falconer but I have humbled people this time. So, <laughs> just, just a different. Uh, uh, I also noticed that you you lived in St. Louis. I did. And and be careful how you answer this question. Even though Mr. McCarter's not here, there are some of us up here that are St. Louis Cardinal fans. We go back to you know the good old black and white movies where they had. Jimmy Stewart is, is pitcher and what have you. You wouldn't be a St. Louis Cardinal fan, would you? I would be. Okay. <laughs> just as long as it's not a Cub fan, we're, we're just, you're, you're, you're two for two. You're doing well. Um, obviously, if you're selected and the governor then appoints you, you will almost immediately be in campaign season. Uh, are you prepared to, or I guess, have you already set up a campaign apparatus or are you going to run should you be selected by the governor? I have not yet set up a campaign, uh, but, uh, but I have spoken with several people about that and talked about campaign committees um, if I'm appointed, I will certainly, uh, certainly run and, and be prepared and get that going. If I'm not appointed by the governor, uh, while I would like the opportunity to explain why I think I'm the best candidate for the position to the Anderson County voters, I do respect this process and I do respect the, the decision of the governor and I would have to think and talk with my family and pray and see if I wanted to continue if I was not. I would also want to see how things were going afterwards. So I don't want to say no, um, but maybe. <laughs> Spoken like a true politician. <laughs> wow. This is... This is um, with, and in all deference to the, uh, the Judge Elder, what would you specifically want to change in the manner that the circuit court ran its and, and how it acted uh, under his 
leadership as the as the judge. What would you change specifically? I'm not really sure what I would change uh, right off the bat because I'm I really appreciated the scheduling orders. I really appreciated the one thing I would want to change. I do think though is the right now if you're you have a civil jury case. Your trial at the docket call is set out for like two years, and so um, if you can get your, if it's something that you don't need a jury, um, you might look at filing in in Chancery Court to maybe get your civil cases heard faster and that type of thing. I think I would look at the docket and how that is set, um, but again, I think uh, the scheduling orders, the pre-trial uh, procedures that Judge Elliott had in place, the knowledge that you needed to be prepared, and um, on time in his, his court, I think, and, and he, held, uh, he held you to those deadlines. I mean, you had to have a really good reason, but again, with, with two years out for, on the civil side, by that time, you should have your case ready to go, and then some. Um, so, you really uh, needed to have a really good reason if you wanted so, to. So, so would you think of expanding trial days to say Saturdays? I'm not sure that I would go that far without getting input from the bar and the court clerk. And uh, there's a lot of things that come into changing, making that kind of a change that I would not feel comfortable with without buy-in from everybody involved. Going into the docket as I understand it over here it's about an 80 20 split between criminal and, and and civil would it be your desire to try to even that out or have it tilt over more to where your expertise maybe in some of the things would help flesh it out and bring it more to and I hate to use the term civil but it is uh, I like to say I practice civil law as opposed to that other stuff. But, <laughs> but would, would you try to coerce, so to speak, bad choice of words, but work with the chancellor to, to, to even that out? I think that the criminal docket um, is is what it is, and it's sort of, it, it's a little different in that you're looking at charges, individual charges instead of uh, like a one concrete case in a lot of the statistics. I'm not really sure that um, you could have n less criminal cases uh, to the extent I am, I am open to working with whomever to fix docket concerns. Um, but I don't know that there's a way to reduce one type of case versus another. I would like, uh, from the civil side standpoint, to have more access with, with jury trials and that, the jury trial type of case. Uh, but I'm, you know, it's one of those things that you can't stop um, charging people with crimes just for the docket. <laughs> Understood. Um, and I'll go to my computers and electronic filings and, and in, you know, in, in the world of the bigger cities where there's always seems to be more money, which is in and of itself somewhat of a crime. Uh, You've got a bunch of old, oh, excuse me, senior members of the bar that just really don't like those newfangled computers because they're confusing and there aren't any eight-year-olds in the house to help them understand <laughs> them. Um, and, and 
the rest of the, you know, you, you, you've got Tribeca out there, which is the electronic system that some of the courts in the middle part of the state, Rutherford County's on it, half of Davidson County, the, the, the Chancery Court is not on Tribeca, it's on something else, but, but Circuit is. Criminal courts and juvenile courts are now electronic. How do you bring uh, senior types like the <laughs> chairman and myself along? I exclude you since you are retired, Ed. But I'm way younger. Than yeah, I understand. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you, as the head, basically, of your court, bring them to the 21st century? I mean, do you just issue an order like Keith London did a number of years ago saying, effective on October 1st, you have to electronically file, and if you don't, you don't. How do you do that? Well, I don't think our county um, is, is um, ready or able to go to a completely electronic filing system like we have in the federal court. I personally um, enjoy being able to file after our, after normal business hours in the federal court. Um, and uh, I also like being able to look up on PACER and see everything that's, that's there. We do have a, a docket system here that is online that you can access. You can pay a subscriber fee and look at your, look at whatever's filed in the clerk's office. Um, and check out dockets, but as far as electronic filing system, I think as Mr. Spitzer pointed out earlier, there's a lot of people, especially um, I think in the criminal side or uh, in general sessions type cases that would not be able, would not have access uh, to the electronic uh, filing systems. As far as um, more senior members who, um, uh, don't particularly um, enjoy the um, benefits of uh, technology. Um, I would say I could only uh, do my best to persuade and make it available. I am not the type of person to tell someone, you know, I think if you issue an order that this is gonna happen and you've got to do this, it just engenders a lot of divisiveness and fear and um, um, I, you, you don't get cooperation, you don't get it, it, in some people it would probably make them less likely. And I'm um, not, the, that's not the way, the, a good approach in my opinion to get people to move to technology is giving an order. I asked the same questions of you, but in a much different format for her. <laughs> I am done, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ms. Water. <laughs> I had not planned on asking questions today. Um, it, uh, this is my first hearing, and so I was not going to, and Mr. Spitzer, I apologize, I didn't ask you this question, but I just got the nerve to <laughs> ask a question. Um, but um, because I'm not an attorney um, and I don't have the legal background that my uh, esteemed colleagues have, but I do have a question. Do you believe justice is blind regardless of a person's race or socioeconomic status? I think that that is an aspirational go. I think in practice, uh, in a lot of ways, in a lot of cases, it is not. It should be. I think we all strive to be. I think we do our best. I think most judges do their best. I think it's important for judges to recognize and do some self, you know, uh, consideration and reflection about what their biases may be. I think here recently, uh, looking uh, with some of the issues that have come to the forefront. Um, I know I've been doing reflection on, on what people, standing in someone else's shoes. One of the things that my 
grandmother um, taught me when I was a little kid. I'm getting, <laughs> I, thinking of her, I just love her so much. But one of the things she told me when I was little, when I knew everything, um, <laughs> um, she said, you know, don't make judgments until you've been in, until you've walked a mile in someone else's shoes. And I think that is very important for people to do is to consider where somebody else is and to walk in their shoes and know what um, um, they're dealing with. So I think it's important to always strive to be, uh, for justice to be blind, but we're human um, and the, I don't think that we, we're there yet in fact, but in desire and aspiration, I think that is what we all strive for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mills? You've obviously practiced in three um, highly respected firms in this area um, for since, I guess, 2000, put my glasses on, since 2003. And two of those have been primarily historically known as defense firms. If you're talking just really generally with the bar, how do you handle like, if you're appointed to this position, um, particularly on the civil side of things, uh, when you have a case come before you, how do you handle uh, if there's a concern, um, say from the plaintiff's bar, that well, you know we know Ms. Crutchfield has handled the, is primarily handled the insurance de or defense matters over the years. How do you handle that to make sure that everybody feels like they've gotten a, their fair day in, in court? I think most of the people that I've practiced with or worked with um, would know um, that, I could, that I could be fair. But if there is, judges are to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. And I would not want anyone to feel um, um, that I would not hear their case fairly or that I would be putting um, big business, you know, ahead of the little guy or, or those types of things. Um, I think it would depend on the circumstances, uh, but I think the, in my experience, um, I think sometimes the judges that I have known and worked with before <laughs> they were on the bench <laughs> um, are very careful and go above and beyond to make sure um, that everything, everyone feels comfortable that it's, it's a fair process. You and I have probably practiced in a lot of the similar courts over the last 20 plus years. Um, and obviously, uh, we've talked a lot about Judge Elledge today, but uh, are there other things you've seen from other courtrooms that you would want to emulate if you're on the bench? I think, um the pretrial process and the status conferences and making sure um, that everybody's on the same page and working toward resolution either through tr jury trial or some agreement or, or something like that is very important. And Judge Elledge, I feel like, was one of those that really held your feet to the fire on scheduling orders and, and that type, the, the process and the procedure. Um, and really um, always being prepared. It, it's hard for me to say because I feel like um, uh, there's probably other things I know I don't want to do. <laughs> um, uh, but the... I think making sure everybody, the predictability, the reliability, knowing that uh, if I'm the judge, I'm gonna be there at this time, court's gonna start at this time, you're gonna have 
uh, deadlines that need to be followed. We're going to have status conferences. We're going to have so that so that things move along, so that the docket moves along. Those are the administrative things and the procedural things that I think are important that I really appreciate it here. Thank you. I don't have anything further. Well, thank you so much for applying for this position. I do, I do have a few questions. The first is that you, you have a uh, perhaps a similar trajectory that many of the students at the National School of Law do that they don't go to law school right after undergraduate school. And so what was it that attracted you to law? Well, I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in high school. And I remember when Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the Supreme Court and uh, was thought that that was amazing. But in the early 80s, uh, good Southern Baptist girls weren't lawyers. And I remember thinking, you know, my parents and my grandparents, um, are you sure that's what you want to do? You know, you're going to have to deal with, you know, a lot of nasty things and uh, mean people and all this kind of stuff. You sure you don't want to go into journalism? You like to write, you know, <laughs> these kind of things. So I kind of took that to heart. But I've always been, um, when Brown Transport went bankrupt, uh, I was like, I had worked with the juvenile courts. I had uh, worked as a house parent. I had gone to court and seen the lawyers do stuff with Brown Transport. I'd seen claims. And I remember thinking, you know, I could have argued that case. You know, I could have settled that case three years ago for cheaper, you know, <laughs> you know, those, those kinds of things came into my mind and I thought, well, I can do this. And I went back to my first love of, you know, when I was um, in high school and moot court and decided I'm going to, this is my chance, I'm going to go to law school. And I've always um, been glad that I did. Um, I've enjoy, I enjoy the practice of law, I enjoy studying the law, uh, but um, um, maybe not as much the business and collections side, <laughs> but, but I do, the, I think it's an admirable profession and I uh, think we can make a difference. Well, parental opinion can be very powerful. Uh, when I told my parents I was going to go to law school, my father asked, he said, son, how have I failed you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean. Let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. I knew sorry, that was coming. I apologize. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> and there's been some questions today, and, and, and it, rightly so, I think, about the concern from moving from the civil world to the criminal world. Uh, 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 the transition might be difficult, but it's not impossible. There's a uh, thinking of a of one of the premier domestic relations attorneys in Nashville named Jim Martin, who was elected to the circuit bench in Williamson County and was confronted with trying criminal cases. He's now one of the most respected judges in the in the 21st judicial district. But I mentioned Jim because uh, uh, shortly after he got on the bench, uh, people would ask him, what's the hardest thing you're doing? And he said, sentencing people. So talk to me a little bit about that. You know, even a prosecutor is not responsible for the sentence. They may plea bargain and, you know, the criminal defense bar is trying to get that sentence either eliminated or as short as possible. But it's ultimately the trial judge within the limits set by the law, but they have some discretion about punishment. You know, is it going to be a sentence? Is it going to be pretrial diversion? Is it going to be probation? Well, how are you going to get your sea legs on that? Well, I've had the honor to serve as a hearing officer for the Board of Professional Responsibility. And I agree that is one of the hardest things, especially uh, when it's a hotly contested issue. And um, uh, 
the looking at the at the rules, looking at the at the facts, uh, and the ABA guidelines in that situation. You you have to make some hard calls, and you know that the decisions you make are going to impact maybe um, prevent someone from practicing as an attorney. Um, but um, I think I, studying the case law, studying the sentencing guidelines, studying uh, the um, the facts of the case that have been determined, I would follow follow the guidelines and um, do the best that I could under those circumstances. To what extent do you think you might be helped? I think one of your, the other applicants mentioned talking with other judges. I, I know that uh, Mr. Martin's case, he had the reputation of importing Davidson County sentencing to Williamson County, and, and there is a individualism among judicial districts on sentencing ideas, so what would you think about seeking advice from people who have actually sentenced around here? Oh, certainly. Um, I would uh, hopefully be able to talk with Judge Elledge, and I've spoken with um, uh, Judge Kyle Hickson in, in Knox County and some of the other uh, criminal court judges in the area certainly would, would consider that a very important resource. I had a, uh, the, the good fortune of marrying into a family that had been in, in Murray County for about eight generations. And uh, one of the things that the patriarch of that family reminded me literally until the day he died was you ain't from here. <laughs> And you know, I've, I've not being a Southerner, I've, I've learned what that meant. <laughs> and I've learned what bless your heart means. <laughs> and I now know that the plural of y'all is all y'all. So, <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I've, ha I've had to learn some things. But the, the you ain't from here, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you in, in a serious way, because I, I do not know Anderson County as well as I know other counties. but. Is that going to be an issue with regard to elections and retention, uh, or, or do you think your roots are deep enough now in Anderson County where your fellow residents would would not say, "Well, she ain't from here"? Well, I've been here for 22 years, and I grew up. I've been in married in that family yeah. for 36. <laughs> <laughs> I still ain't from here. Yeah. Well, it won't I, ever be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. Um, I, I certainly haven't felt that way living here um, and participating uh, in community service and on the Anderson County Economic Development Board and um, uh, various nonprofits and, and that sort of thing. I haven't experienced that. I grew up in North Knoxville. I lived in Campbell County. Um, uh, for a few years, my husband's family is, is from Campbell County. His business is there. So I feel like I'm from here. Uh, nobody's, uh, uh, I guess, I've not gotten the yank from around here. Uh, but um, certainly in the north, north side of the county, I'm not as well connected or, or well known. Um, but. Um, um, I would uh, say that the the connections that I do have um, in the community, I would um, I would soon be meeting those people, especially if I'm running a campaign. <laughs> well, and it could be unique to me or Murray County. I, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, you. it's, it's really you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Murray County. <laughs> he does have that down pretty well. Yeah. Uh, I've got three more quick questions, perhaps not so quick. And the first one is, and I really want to learn from you about this. You've already had one question. You've had the little lady question. And you'll hopefully, uh, us older members of the bar are working through that some. But, you know, gender issues uh, in many contexts 
can be very complicated. And, and uh, you know, I can remember in the late 80s, early 90s, the Lawyers Association for Women filed a petition with the Court of Appeals asking for our opinion about whether women could wear slacks to court. And we viewed that as a existential threat because we were all getting ready to run for office and we figure if we answer this question wrong that the women are gonna vote us out and all this sort of stuff. So being, being about 40 years younger than the presiding judge, I got appointed to go be the delegate to find out what was really going on. And the answer was, we just really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our response ended up being, the court's response was, we don't care. You know, it's a professional environment, just wear what a professional would wear. But that just tells you, though, it, it, it's just sensitive. You know, folks are trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, if you're on the bench, uh, you certainly would have every cause to hold a a bench conference or going to chambers if somebody insisted on calling you little lady, that's, that's just impolite. But, and again, I'm just, I'm curious. Wonder, wonder, if, it is, wonder if, the, if you say, you know, will you agree to break at 12 o'clock for lunch and, and the lawyer says, yes, ma'am. Is that something you, that you think is problematic? No. <laughs> Some do. Um. I would prefer that, you know, as a judge to be called your honor, but I think a lot of people automatically say yes ma'am and no sir and that type of thing as a matter of politeness without even thinking about it. And if it was an ongoing or if I felt, you know, lots of times there's context and tone, and if I felt like it was something that they said with some type of intention. Mm -hmm. I might talk to them about it later, but um, my first instance is just that was a a slip, you know. Um, I think it really depends on how it was said um, and the context, but for the most part, if it's just a comment of yes ma'am out of, you know, um, that's not something that I feel offended by. Okay. Uh, the second, second question, you've been asked to talk about injustice. And uh, I'm gonna give you a faction scenario that played out in Nashville last week about injustice and just see how you, you might handle this. Uh, we had a police shooting in Nashville about six, seven years ago. A policeman shot a fleeing suspect in the back, and there's video of it. Uh, the state's case had some real problems. Well, this has been hanging on now for years and years, and on the eve of trial, the district attorney and the defense counsel negotiated a guilty plea for a 15-year sentence. Of course, in our system now, victims' rights are important and victims are paid attention to, and so at the sentencing hearing, the victim's mother is allowed to address the court and weeping and being held up by her two of her children, she tells the judge what an injustice has occurred because she thought uh, the defendant should either get a much more lengthy criminal sentence or something worse. Now you're sitting on the bench, you're gonna encounter things like that. What, other than saying adjourned court, what do you say in that circumstance to that deceased's mother? I don't, I really don't know. Um, because um, that's a truly heartbreaking case. And I, um, I mean, just the, the circumstances, not necessarily uh, the sentence is the sentence. I've, there's so many things that you don't know that lay people, that even as a judge, you don't necessarily know what went into this plea agreement. 
there's facts and issues that the attorneys have worked out that the judge isn't always privy to. Um, and uh, there's also the, um, the issue of so much of the time lay people who aren't lawyers, who aren't familiar with sentencing guidelines and, and um, uh, standards of proof and elements of, of crimes or, or torts, uh, don't understand uh, how a certain result could be arrived at. And so um, that would be, that would be very hard. I think to explain the the factors that go into a sentencing and accepting a plea, and it it, it will not uh, her pain is not going to be I don't think resolved by any sentence, um, and um, the um, I don't know that anything a judge could say. I think the original injustice is, is feeling like her child was shot in the back. Um, and um, there's no way to bring him back or that the justice system can address some of those things. My last question is a little easier and perhaps not quite as emotional, but I, <laughs> I read in your application that you're not a big fan of Deadman versus Steelman. Well... <laughs> <laughs> I um, from the standpoint I understand the collateral source rule and I know why we have the collateral source rule but from a standpoint of damages knowing that the actual medical expenses that are paid um, are rarely the medical expenses that are charged in this day and time. That's one area where um, um, I just feel like it's, it promotes a fiction, um, but uh, of, of, the, of the actual damages. But that being said, um, that's the law and, and we follow it. Well, you, you then did not have an objection to an earlier Opinion that said you that hospitals could not impose a lien for the full amount of the charges They could only impose a lien for the amount of the actual uh, insurance reimbursement Well um, Different statute and uh, different scenario from collections uh, I mean as far as collections from proof of damages and so I looked at that as more of a, this is what you were, this is um, what you actually received and you accepted it as far as the hospital is concerned. Whereas in a tort matter, um, the plaintiff is putting up damages that they uh, are out of pocket on medical expenses and that type of thing when actuality it, that might not be the correct amount that was actually owed. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Do we want to do another? Do we prefer to break for a quick break? break. We have a break. We will uh, be in recess for lunch until quarter after 12. That's what you call ruining someone else's lunch time. Yes. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. All right. <laughs> Next, the panel.